morning, everybody. Thank you very much. And let's start first talking about uh, the definition of non-cardiac chest pain. Uh, it's a very common problem, and uh, it's been defined as recurrent chest pain that is indistinguishable from ischemic heart pain after a reasonable workup excluded a cardiac cause. So the emphasis on this definition is the fact that before you consider NCCP, non-cardiac chest pain, as a diagnosis, you have to make sure that patients don't have a cardiac disease as the underlying cause of their symptoms. Now, obviously, the question is, what is the extent of cardiac workup that you need? And in my practice, I usually leave it to the cardiologist to decide, and I'm not the one that, that pursues the, this uh, uh, cardiology workup. Now, when you look around the world, it appears that up to 20% of the adult population will experience non-cardiac chest pain at least once during their lifetime. So it's very common. There's no gender predilection. It affects women and men at the same level. Uh, for some reason, during, between the age 50 and 59, we see it more common in females than males. And uh, it looks also that as we get older, we see less NCCP. It's very interesting that when you look at uh, acute chest pain that is presenting uh, at the level of the emergency department, you will find out that ischemic heart disease is not the number one cause, but instead it will be a gastrointestinal disease where esophageal disorders are the number one cause. One has to add also to the list that panic disorder is also a very important driving underlying disorder for acute chest pain. Now, there are many reasons for why patients have non-cardiac chest pain, and many of them are not related to the gastrointestinal tract, like musculoskeletal disorders, pulmonary and pericardial disorders. You can have even gastric, biliary, and pancreatic disorders that present exclusively with chest pain. And then you have panic disorder, which is one of the most common psychiatric disorders that present with chest pain, especially acute chest pain. But yet, when you look at the esophageal disorders, then by far, the most common is gastroesophageal reflux as the underlying cause for these patients' symptoms, followed by what we call functional chest pain. And then we have a small subset of patients that have some type of esophageal dysmotility that is responsible for their chest pain. Now, when you look at patients with heartburn symptoms, here, for example, this is a meta-analysis that was done, and they looked at patients that have typical symptoms of GERD, and they found out that if you have them, you have five-fold increased risk of having also report of non-cardiac chest pain, showing an association between the two. Overall, when we look at patients with what we call GERD-related NCCP, the studies suggested that only a small number of them will demonstrate erosive esophagitis, probably as low as 10%. So most of the time, it will be NERD-related NCCP, and about 50 to 60% of them will demonstrate abnormal esophageal acid exposure. Now, the question, of course, that everybody asks is, if I identify erosive esophagitis in patients with uh, non-cardiac chest pain, or I find out that they have abnormal esophageal acid exposure. Is GERD is the true underlying cause for this patient chest pain? And this study, for example, looked into this and found out that 80% of the patients that have uh, abnormal pH tests and or erosive esophagitis will respond to anti-reflux treatments, suggesting that if you have one of them abnormal, then there is a high likelihood that gastroesophageal reflux is the underlying cause of patients' NCCP. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about the mechanisms for chest pain in GERD patients. And that's very important because there are many hypotheses. There's not even one. And we're always trying to find out why patients develop certain symptoms. Well, let me go. Let's start at the, at the, at the top. So there is 
data. We have data demonstrating that in, a, in these patients there is a decreased flow in coronary circulation. This is what we call link angina, meaning that as a result of free flux, patients develop decrease in blood flow within the coronary arteries, leading to pain, suggesting that potentially the chest pain comes from the heart. Now, there is also some data suggesting that potentially we're looking at a correlation between gastroesophageal reflux disease and ischemic heart disease. And I'll show you the reason for that. The characteristics of the reflux episode. This is kind of an old story. I noticed that there was a recent publication in the American Journal of Gastroenterology about this, but it's been noted before that maybe certain characteristics of the reflux may lead to chest pain instead of heartburn. For example, a very low pH or a prolonged low pH. So these are two examples of why patients potentially may get chest pain instead of heartburn. And then we had those studies suggesting that if you use intraesophageal ultrasonography, then you can identify that when patients with NCCP develop chest pain as a result, of reflux, and you can document at the same time sustained longitudinal muscle esophageal contraction. The longitudinal muscle, as you all know, is the outermost muscle that we have in the esophagus, and it's not commonly assessed, for example, during uh, esophageal manometry. The other thing is reduced esophageal blood flow, the local ischemia model, which obviously some people suggest that maybe the reason why patients develop chest pain is because they develop some local ischemia. Esophageal hypersensitivity as a result of acidic sensitization, and then esophageal hypercontractility, that as a result of reflux you develop some hypercontractile motility disorder and the hypercontractility leads to the chest pain. Now, it's very interesting that when you look at the inflammatory biomarkers that are increased in gastroesophageal reflux disease, like IL-8 or IL-6, these are the same inflammatory mar markers, mediators, that have been implicated in the formation of atherosclerotic lesions in coronary arteries. So these are the same inflammatory biomarkers, potentially suggesting that there is a correlation between this is the data about the longitudinal, the sustained longitudinal muscle contractions as a result of reflux in patients with NCCP. And this is a study in an animal model, and this is a study that noticed that the esophageal contractions that were induced either by electrical stimulation of the vagus nerve or direct electrical stimulation of the muscle resulted in reduction in the esophageal wall perfusion in a dose-dependent fashion. En una forma dependiente de la dosis, y esto es en respuesta. Y esto podría ser en respuesta al reflujo. Potentially suggesting that maybe some of the patients have local ischemia, leading to chest pain. Lo que lleva a lo precordial. Now we have esophageal hypersensitivity, and we know that patients with narcotic chest pain demonstrate that, and this could be due to peripheral and central sensitization, or because of altered central processing of visceral stimulus. Now, we do know from some of the studies uh, that came, for example, from Dr. Kasim Aziz, that if you take patients with non-cardiac chest pain and you expose them to reflux in the lower part of the esophagus, then they also develop increased sensitivity in the upper part of the esophagus, which was not exposed to acid reflux. And at the same time, you can also develop sensitivity uh, at the chest wall. These are all areas, somatic areas, esophageal, visceral areas, that all converge at the same level of the spinal cord, explaining why exposure to increased sensitivity in the lower part of the esophagus may result in increased sensitivities in patients. Now, we're all familiar with this. This is a patient with Jack Hammer esophagus. 
And it has been shown by some studies, although many of them were done in patients with nutcracker esophagus, uh, esophagus, which has debunked by the uh, Chicago classification. But it was suggested that reflux may lead to a hypercontractile response, either in the form of nutcracker esophagus or jackhammer esophagus. And that can lead to chest pain in patients. Although, when you look at the presence of these abnormalities in this patient, you can see that it's really the minority of these patients. So that brings me to functional chest pain. Uh, this is the ROM4 definition of these patients. It is a retrosternal chest pain or discomfort, absence of associated esophageal symptoms, such as heartburn and or dysphagia, absence of evidence that gastroesophageal reflux disease or eosinophilic esophagitis are the cause of symptoms, and absence of esophageal motor disorders, of major motor disorders, and that cardiac cause should be ruled out, and you can see at the bottom the list of what is called major esophageal motor disorders. Criteria must be fulfilled for the past three months with symptoms onset at least six months before diagnosis. Now, when you look at patients with functional chest pain, some of the mechanisms that have been suggested to cause symptoms in these patient populations are already mentioned in relation to gastroesophageal reflux induced chest pain. But there is another one which is unique to functional chest pain, which is abnormal mechanophysical properties, especially hyperactive esophagus or decreased compliance esophagus. Now, if you do a compliance curve in the esophagus while distending a balloon, when you look at the, ra at the ratio between pressure and volume, the yellow line suggests what you would expect normally. Now, it's not a straight line because the esophagus is not, it's just not sitting there when you inflate a balloon. There is constant contraction from the esophagus in response to the inflated balloon in order to push the balloon into the stomach. But what you see in patients with functional chest pain is a shift to the left in the compliance curve. So now, for a smaller volume of air, you get a higher pressure, suggesting a stiffer esophagus. And so this is one of the potential mechanisms for non cardiac chest pain in patients for functional chest pain. And as I mentioned, studies have shown that patients with functional chest pain have lower perception thresholds for pain balloon distension protocol as compared to normal subjects. Psychological comorbidity is an important contributing mechanism for functional chest pain. And many studies have suggested that most of these patients are affected by psychological comorbidity. And the most common ones are depression, panic disorder, anxiety, and even somatization. Now, how do you diagnose, uh, how do you work up a patient with non cardiac chest pain? And this is a proposed algorithm that I put together with John Pandolfino. Now, it looks pretty busy, but I'll go through this real quick. So, if you have patients that they have chest pain, they should undergo history and physical exam, and if it suggests that it's a non-esophageal etiology, you evaluate accordingly. If, if it is not, then you have to rule out a cardiac cause, and that is usually done in my practice by a cardiologist. And, and if it's negative, then you, you perform a response to PPI. Now, I know that there was some mentioning about the value of the PPI test, and I can argue about it later during the discussion, but at least one thing I can say, the studies that look specifically at the role of the PPI test in non cardiac chest pain, all the meta-analysis have shown that it does work and it's a highly sensitive test in identifying patients with GERD-related ancestors. Now, if the PPI trial is negative, then you do an upper endoscopy with biopsies. If it's negative, then you need to do some reflux testing. In the case of chest pain, it is recommended to do it off PPI treatment. 
sin el tratamiento and then, PP, if anti PPI. Si el paciente no demuestra una prueba normal de PH o no tiene esofagial motor disorder, trastorno major, motriz esofágico motor mayor, mayor o es importante. Entonces mira uno el dolor precordial funcional. Now this is the concept of uh, este es concept the PPI test in NCCP, which was, NCCP, by the way, the original place of the PPI test, and this is the use of a short course of high-dose PPI as a test in diagnosing GERD, usually a week or two weeks, and this is to make diagnosis. This is not for the purpose of therapy, and the studies have shown a relatively high sensitivity and not bad specificity, again, in uh, patients with non-cardiac chest pain. There were several meta-analyses that confirmed the value of the test. What therapies we can offer our patients with GERD-related NCCP? H2 blockers. There are studies, although they have demonstrated that H2 blockers have limited effect on GERD-related NCCP. The PPIs, in particular, double dose, and it's not clear how long. The study, some of them use two months, some of them three months. It appears to work in these patients that have GERD-related NCCP. And the value of endoscopy or anti-reflux surgery in these patients remains to be seen because most of the studies that we have included patients that were very very selected and carefully selected. And so, uh, especially in our practice, if you decide to send any one of them to surgery, you have to document that they do have GERD as the underlying cause and they don't have any major esophageal motor disorder. This is, uh, in fact, one of the studies that looked at the role of PPI in patients uh, with uh, non-cardiac chest pain. These patients have GERD-related NCCP, uh, a double-blind placebo-controlled trial that showed uh, a 7%, uh, sorry, a 9% therapeutic gain as compared to placebo. Not that impressive, but the study was uh, statistically significant, as you can see. These are various studies that looked at the value of uh, laparoscopic Nissan final plication or various endoscopic techniques to treat GERD in patients with non-cardiac chest pain. And you can see that many of them were positive, but again, many of them were, did not include, obviously, a sham uh, arm and uh, the patients were very carefully selected. What about functional chest pain? In this situation, most of our options are what we call neuromodulators, and they include tricyclic antidepressants, uh, trazodone, SSRIs, SNRIs, adenosine antagonists, cognitive behavioral therapy, hypnotherapy and alternative therapy like Joe Ray therapy and others. Now, this is a very busy uh, table, but this table actually is in the uh, paper that we have in uh, the general issue of gastro. But what's important is you can see the value of various medications that were properly studied in a randomized controlled trials in patients with NCCP as well as other functional esophageal disorders. Studies uh, were done where they were looking at the hierarchy of antidepressants for esophageal pain reduction and global health improvement, and they've shown that actually venlafaxine, which is an SNRI, is, appears to be the best. Now, because it does affect patient's sleep, I usually do not prescribe it at bedtime. If you use it, then I prescribe it in the morning, because it does make the patient jittery. Uh, bueno, a los uh, here is uh, studies uh, looking at the value of energy healing, uh, one of the alternative approaches, Joe Ray, Reiki, and in patients with functional chest pain con dolor with, precordial, with a significant improvement in their symptoms. So always address Entonces, psychological comorbidities in functional chest pain patients. We have a lot of data about cognitive behavioral therapy. Most of the literature that we have currently on the NCCP comes from the psychiatric, uh, from the psychiatric literature because they deal with a lot of these patients and cognitive behavioral therapy, hypnotherapy, and now mindfulness have been areas of uh, uh, great help to these patients. This is, by the way, a study looking at hypnotherapy, suggesting that uh, hypnotherapy 
que la hipnoterapia sí tiene un efecto importante en los pacientes con dolor. So, I'm not going to go through this type of algorithm. No You've seen enough of them. Este but if you want to look at it, this was published in Allometric Pharmacopoeia last year by Nina George and colleagues. So, I'd like to thank you. Con esto les agradezco. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you.